What is one thing that unites every single dog owner throughout all time? Eventually, we all have to say goodbye. He was not old. It was not his time. I will spare you the drama, except to say, I lived in the pupil of his eye. Hello, and welcome to The Long Leash. I'm James Jacobson, and reading that poem was today's guest, Jim Mitchum. That poem is one among 52 different stories from people all over the world that Jim has compiled into a heartwarming book called Gone Dogs. The book is a tribute to dogs that have left us, written by the people who love those dogs. What started off as merely a blog post about his beloved dog's passing has transformed Jim's life. We pulled this conversation from our archives and have reached back to see what happened in Jim's life since we last spoke. I'll share those updates after the interview. Jim Mitchum, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Jim. Glad to be here. So I am holding your book in my hands, Gone Dogs, a tale of dogs we've loved. And I must say that when I read it, I sat down with a box of Kleenex because there were a few of these stories in this collection where I just bawled my eyes out. It is a beautiful book or collection of tributes to dogs that have passed. Yes, I agree. I think it's an incredibly emotional book because the people who are dog people, you know, we understand their short lives. And it's kind of like this thing that hangs over us their whole lives. Mm -hmm. So the qualification to be in this book was that the dog had to be gone. And um, the amount of love that that people poured into these stories is remarkable. And even the funny ones are emotional because you can picture yourself in these scenarios. So So this is a crowdsourced collection. How did you amass this? So it started after the passing of my dog, Tucker, whose story is in here toward the end, is called Just a Dog. Mm-hmm. And Page 191. Yes. As a writer and a blogger, I posted, you know, just a tribute about him. And it was one of those things where I was trying to figure out why I was feeling this deep grief. You know, he was my first dog as an adult. And it just dawned on me, I'm like, because he's my friend. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, he was one of my best friends ever. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when I wrote about it, the outpouring of love and support from people all across the world who I'd never met was overwhelming to me. And in 2014, his pack mate, who's on the cover, Sydney, she passed. And, and of course, you know, I did it again because it was very cathartic to write about them. And this same thing occurred. And I thought, man, the world needs a collection of these stories. And I went to my designer and, and talked to her about it. And we together decided it was worth our our time and effort to look into it. And within the first year, people were signing up for our newsletter, trying to find out when we were going to take submissions for entry. And it was, it was remarkable. Well, where did these people come from? I mean, you started promoting it or how did that happen? We use social media, both my design partner, Lori Smithwick and I are both veterans of social media mm. and early adopters. And we had pretty big networks and I'm in advertising, so this is really interesting. You'll see that the forward's by Lee Clow. Mm-hmm. Now, if, if you don't know who Lee Clow is, he is the guy who came up with the 1984 Apple Super Bowl commercial. He is a legend in the advertising world. He was one of Steve Jobs' good friends, did all the Apple, I'm a PC, I'm a Mac. He, he's this genius ad guy. I've never met him personally, but my network knows him, and there are eight copywriters and, and four designers in this book because when we put out the call for submissions, our networks got attached to it real fast. And, and anybody who's a dog person, you know, will gravitate to this idea. Mm-hmm. But we used Facebook. And so we actually have stories from three different continents, six countries, places I can't even sell the book, unfortunately, because we're self-published and, and mailing is really hard. But we have stories from South Africa and Portugal and England and Canada and you know, it's a universal idea 
And that was the idea, was to, to create a book of experiences from people everywhere. So you ended up with 53, 52, 53 submissions? 52. That are in the book. How many did you have to call through to collect the ones that you published? So even though we're deeply connected, uh, Lori and I, you know, we can only reach so far. We had no funding or anything. So we received about 150 submissions for this book. And it was tough going through them. I, I, I had five writers do the judging, published writers. And, um, you know, each story went through an editing process. Even the, some of the great writers we have here, their stories were edited too. But I responded to every person who didn't make it into the book directly just because I know what it meant to them. Mm. You know, I, I, I read these stories. I cried through them. I, I felt them. And we couldn't use them all. So I made it a point to contact each person directly instead of just a mass email, you know, sorry, you didn't make it in. Um, Thanks for your submission about your dead dog. But, uh, <laughs> exactly. Better luck next time. Yeah. Let us know when you another dog dies. That's okay. Did the contributors, I mean, this is sort of a crowdsource in the way that the whole many of almost all the chicken soup for the soul books were done. Was that an inspiration as you were putting this plan together? I've never read a chicken soup for the soul book, but I understand what they are. And yeah, it was, I think they did theirs before, like before the internet or before social media for sure. But mm -hmm. yes, the chicken soup for the soul was definitely kind of a template that we used as an anthology. Uh, I don't know how they sourced their, their stories, but I'm sure now they use the internet or social media as well. It's brilliant to do that. And, you know, we started on Facebook because that's where people are. And people have dogs and you join Facebook and you click all the likes. And if you click, you like dogs, you're going to see content about dogs. So it's a remarkable place to be because, you know, publishing a book is one thing, but building a community is something else altogether. And I, I've had a really fun time doing that. I mean, it's, it's grown my love for dogs is building the community on Facebook and social media. Tell me about the community, what's going on in the community and social. I'm a marketer, a copywriter by trade in advertising, and uh, I've never done community building directly. I don't even think that was a thing until social media, probably in the last five or six years. But the ability to engage people directly, you know, I get feedback on this book a lot, and consistently people are like, this book has helped me to grieve my dog. I thank you so much for it. And to hear that, because on the one hand, you know, I'm trying to build a brand and build a business, and I, I want to do multiple volumes. And that's all business stuff. And from a business side, it looks like a really good idea because, you know, people love dogs. But on the human side, the community side is where the purpose comes in, I guess. Mm -hmm. There's a deep sense of purpose for creating this, this book and this idea that it affects people in a real and sincere way and building the community and, and engaging people consistently and having laughs with them and sharing in their sorrow. And, you know, that to me, that's the purpose of this whole thing. And tell me about some of the stories that most resonate with you, things that kind of haunt you to this day. At this point, you've probably spent a lot of time with each one of these and the selection and the layout and the design of the book. But what are some of the stories that are most poignant? Well, you know, everyone. And I know that that's, that's a cop out, but, um, there are certain stories in here that there's a poem called dead dog. Mm, just a few words, but chilling. Yeah. Extremely haunting. And will you read that for us? Yeah, sure. Let's grab the page here. Okay. So dead dog by Lisa Underwood. He was not old. It was not his time. I will spare you the drama except to say. I lived in the pupil of his eye. And, and then the, the, there's a picture with every story. And this picture is just so beautiful. And, you know, one of the things about dealing with photographs from people around the world is that you're not getting the best imagery. And some of these dogs have been dead for decades. And this is one of them. And it's a very hauntingly beautiful image of Lisa's dog, Bo. And um, I don't know, it's just one of those quick little poems that just affect me. Like I get chills when I read it. There's another one. And of course, like I said, they're all great. There are a few that are just beyond, I mean, in terms of storytelling, Tony Talent submitted a story called A Dog Can Change Everything. It's one of the longer 
stories in our book, but it reads like Harper Lee. <laughs> you know, this he's a great Southern writer, and it's just by itself is a beautiful story. We have stories from Jenny Boylan, who's a New York Times op-ed author and a published author herself. DJ Hill, who's out in Colorado, her, her story, Harry, it's just on and on, one after another. But there is one that I do read when I go to, you know, bookstores. But again, it's one of these things where I can't pick one that really stands out to me, but this one really resonates. It's called Dog Disobedience. It's by Mary Trafford, and it's about her dog, Hazel. Eight weekly sessions, you trotted by her side, listening, watching, thick strap of leather, collaring your bound energy, obeying, obeying. Eighth week, the test for good dogs, and you are a good dog. Today, you'll show her all the dogs waiting in turn, good dogs with tense humans watching, watching. Six legs, yours and hers, keeping pace, forward ho, left turn, about turn, heel, sit, stay, good dog, pat, pat. And soon, the final test, the long sit, stay, wait for it, 60 seconds, your test to sit, stay, stay still. You sit, try to stay still. You shiver, held in energy, threatens to unleash itself upon you, waiting, wait. And you're off. Can't stand it. Just can't sit still. You're galloping light, quick, bright around the other dogs. They jump up and they're off. You, their leader. A cackle of hyenas wild around the hall as strained human voices call. Come, stop, get him, catch her. But it's we what fun as you run and run and run as one by one. Each dog is caught and laughter breathes relief around the hall. You slow down. You go to her. She holds you, leans toward you, and whispers, good dog. Powerful. Yeah, that's, it's my life. We're going to take a quick break right here. But when we come back, we will hear more about Jim. We'll be right back. And now, a message from your dog. Every day with you is like a day at the beach, and I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want Everpup. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it. It's a strange thing to do, sprinkle this powder on my food, but I wouldn't have it any other way. My time with you is precious and irreplaceable, and I'm thrilled to be with you for as long as possible. Here's to puppy playtime and senior snoozes. <laughs> no matter how old I get, I want my ever pup. It just makes me feel good in this life. And the next, and the next, and the next. I am so grateful to be your dog and for the ever pup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup, every day. Welcome back. So this has really become your life's work, right? Between your community and, and selling books and you see future books on the horizon. Yeah, yeah. And definitely volume two, people are chomping at the bit. They want to submit stories. And we, between COVID and uh, doing this as a part-time gig, sure. it's really tough to to do it the right way and devote that kind of time toward it. But this fall, both Lori and our daughters, we each have two daughters, are off in college. So we <laughs> we have we have a little bit of time. Next on the long leash the dog that inspired Jim Mitchum to write Gone Dogs. 
Let's talk about the inspiration for all of this, Tucker. You have this beautiful story. Tucker, you woke up one day, Tucker had had a stroke, and you knew that was the day that you had to say goodbye. Yeah. You know, it, my first go with a dog that was passing, as an adult, as a child, there were a couple of dogs who, you know, it's hard to remember that, but I do remember those dogs' names, and I still remember, that. you know, you just never forget a dog. So Tucker is about 13 years, and um, he was like the heart and soul of our small, young family. Hmm. And he was the first before the children, before the other dog. And knowing that the goodbye was upon us was a really heavy thing to deal with. And I think for me, writing about it was a relief, you know, and almost to a person, the people that submitted stories for this book said the same thing. You know, it's like, it was like their own goodbye to a dog that's been lingering in their mind. Why do you think people are interested in hearing the stories about other people's deceased dogs? It, that's a really good question because it sounds so morbid. But the, the truth is, it's not about a dead dog. It's about the dogs when they're living, like Hazel just there with mm -hmm. running around this hall and I mean, I personally, I visualize myself with my crazy dogs. And I think that that's what it is, is people identify with each of the stories. You might not identify with every single story in this book, but I promise you that if you love dogs, something will resonate inside of you with every story. This book really resonates with me because I've made such a big part of my life for the last 40 years focusing on dogs that are near the end or have gone and recently my wife and I figured out we have this big hallway, two story foyer that's kind of a giant waste of space because it's this giant thing that does. And we decided to fill it with portraits of dogs that had been passed because, you know, there are people who really love their dogs sometimes go to the extravagance or whatever to, to, you know, not just have a, a little photo, but to really, you know, commission a portrait. So we are collecting oils and all sorts of things from eBay and places like that, from dogs that have been gone for many years. What a great idea. And so we're basically creating a, we're rescuing dog portraits. That's amazing. But you can feel the energy. Like I, this morning I received an email from a neighbor who said that, will you please consider adopting my aunt's thing? It was included a photo. It was, um, Signed 1960. It was a, it's a beautiful portrait of the dog. Wow. And he says, I can't imagine giving it to Goodwill. Wow. And so we are creating <laughs> a collection, an art gallery of gone dogs. That's a great, great idea. I think I might copy that now. <laughs> uh, we'll create it, a bidding it, war on eBay for, exactly. for dogs that have gone because there's not a lot of demand, really. No, no but, but there will be, but trust me. Um, so when you look at these images and you see these portraits, you're not looking at just a flat, you know, one dimensional image of a dog. You're, mm -hmm. you're looking at that dog's eyes. You're seeing it because you're a dog person. You know, mm -hmm. you know that these are sentient beings just like us. And when they're in your soul and you're in their soul, you know, you can look at any dog and feel that. It's the reason why when, and I'm going to guess you're like me with this, but if I'm out in a festival or something, I'm going to the dog. I'm looking for the dogs, you know, just to pat them, see if they're, they'd be friendly to me, put my hand out because dogs, man, they're truth. They're as true as anything. So tell me about your current dog. So we have three, four, if you count my mother-in-law's dog, who I found on the street. Oh, I thought you were going to say your mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I found a dog. She was a cat person and, and she moved in with us like 15 years ago and, and 14 years ago, I found a puppy on the street and I tried mm. finding who it was. I went around the neighborhood and nobody claimed it. And it was a little black puppy. Well, she's 14 and she's got cancer and she's on her last legs, but we take her to the park every day and she plays ball and, mm. you know, so that's Noel. And then we have three and one of them is named Sammy and he's kind of a superstar. He's like this 12 pound Chihuahua, we're guessing Chihuahua bulldog, um, man. Nobody knows, but he's orange and he's 13 pounds and he's got an underbite and he's got one eye and he's just, he looks like a Disney character. And when my daughters were small, they created an Instagram account for him and they had like more followers than I had at one point. 
And he's just this, this amazing character. Well, he's also like, he turns 14 next week. And then behind him is Strider, who's an Australian shepherd. And I've had Australian shepherds for 25 years, starting with Tucker. And Strider is like, he was the worst puppy who ever lived. And I know I'm not allowed to say this, but between you and me, I purchased the domain puppiesarepools.com. And if you go there, it's dedicated to everything he destroyed when he was a puppy. <laughs> so he's my best friend. I mean, we take vacations with our dogs and, you know, like this guy, he, I don't know, he's 11. He just turned 11 last week. We're going to put a link to the show notes because we'll have bleeped out yes. that title, but we're going to put a link in the show notes for this because it is a great website. And he's the best. Now. He's the best dog now, but terrible, terrible puppy. Bogart's the sweetest dog I've ever had. He is destroyed sandals. He everything. Oh, no. And my drip lines. Oh my gosh. And then we have Bogart. Bogart's a, a Labradoodle mix kind of thing. And um, his sweetest dog I ever had when he was a puppy, I would lay on my chair at night when we're watching TV or whatever, and I would put him on my chest. Well, he's eight years old now, and he still does that every night. So I've got a 65-pound dog on my chest every night that I have to stroke <laughs> a certain way. And it's just a great pack. And it's an aging pack, and that's something that's new to me. So it's been really interesting because, you know, at this point before, when I had old dogs, I'd get new dogs to try to integrate them into the pack. Well, we decided with this, we're just going to let this pack go. And I think at some point, once Strider leaves, Bogart's going to have a really hard time. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, we'll add to our pack. Maybe a little puppy. A little puppy. Will, That's right. Sometimes makes them come alive again. Yeah. Did writing this book and being so immersed in this project change your relationship with your dogs? It did. I've grown closer to them. You know, I, I don't take it for granted anymore. And I think at some point I probably took my relationship with my dogs for granted a little bit. They're always here for me, you know, when I want to throw the ball, whatever. But seeing how this relationship plays out across the world to everyone who loves dogs has changed definitely how I think about them being in my life now. And I don't take it for granted anymore. And, you know, they're just dogs. But again, my best friends, you know, like I have a few really good human friends and my family is, of course, my family, but these guys are like, they, they keep me on my toes, man. It's great. Every day people are losing dogs and people around them want to do something and you can send some flowers or whatever. But I think giving them a copy of this book is a really nice way of sending your condolences. Have you seen people doing that? Yes. And it shocks me. I definitely didn't create this with that in mind. Mm -hmm. I just figured that the stories would resonate with dog lovers. But here's the thing. Everybody who has a dog is going to outlive it. 95% of people. And so anybody who's loved the dog has lost the dog, has had to go through that. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, well, that'll hit home with people. And sure enough, it has. But the people who are giving it as gifts is probably half of the sales right now. It's remarkable. I didn't expect this. So it's a perfect condolence gift because, you know, it also helps the reader because the reader feels validated. I think it may have even been the title of your story about Tucker. It's just a dog. So often people don't understand why the loss is so intense and why you're grieving it as if it were a member of the family. And, uh, this book helps validate those feelings because you know, you're not alone. There are a lot of people who feel this way with them about dogs. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's the thing about community is understanding that. And then we're about to launch a, cause we have the, you know, the Facebook page, but then there's another part of Facebook where we can create more of a group, I think, or something. I'm not mm -hmm. sure, but mm -hmm. that's the next step. So we're talking about doing a few different things and creating that group. And again, it comes down to timing, like, cause I don't want to do it unless it's done well, mm -hmm. but I think there's a need for that because people are going through stuff and, and there's a lot of people want to help. When someone comes on and they say, you know, I lost my dog last month, people respond to that. They go, they just outpouring of love and support. It's remarkable. But you're right. One of the things I wanted to try to do with this book was to create this like lasting impression. So at the beginning of the book, I write this. I said, from its inception, Gone Dogs was intended to be a celebration of the bond between dogs and people. A kiss goodnight that will resonate with anyone who's ever loved a dog. And to me, that it's that kiss goodnight. You know, it's like, we all go through it. Yeah. 
Jim Mitchum, thank you so much for being with us today. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Jim. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time and doing this. And uh, I'm so happy to hear that you enjoyed the book. If you would like to pick up your own copy of Gone Dogs or gift it to somebody who has recently experienced the loss of their dog, we have a link for the book in today's show notes. Now, as promised, we have a few updates to share with you from Jim. The most important update, Jim says, is a Facebook group that they created for grieving dog parents. He wrote us, quote, Having a Gone Dogs Facebook page is one thing to create awareness for the book, but the longer I do this, and it's going on six years now, the more I realize that we needed to create a private group just for people who have to say goodbye to their dogs and need a place to safely grieve. I feel like I have a responsibility to help people get past the heartache of the loss and to see the beauty in the relationship as a whole. That's the reason that we made the book at all. We will include a link to that new Facebook group in our show notes. Jim is not currently soliciting for volume two of Gone Dogs, but if he does, we will let you know. Well, that's all for today. I'd like to thank you so much for joining us. If you have some thoughts about people that you would like to hear on The Long Leash, please let us know. You can get in touch with us via our website at longleashshow.com. Also, check out all of the sister shows on Dog Podcast Network, and you can find those on our main website at dogpodcastnetwork.com. If you haven't already, I encourage you to subscribe to this podcast in your favorite podcast app. We're also on YouTube. And most importantly, please tell a friend about Dog Podcast Network and The Long Leash. It helps us grow and it helps us share the wisdom that dogs have to teach us with other dog lovers. I'm James Jacobson. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. Aloha.